that image that you see on the front cover there is, is not a painting, it's a photograph by Simon Sefton, and it's a photograph of Cape Water, which, as you may know from any walks in the mountain that you've done, is a dark water um, with an orange tinge. Um, and um, yeah, so that's by Simon Sefton, it's an extraordinary water photography based here in Cape Town. Um, well, I mean, this book uh, began on a bicycle, looking down roads, something like that one in the middle. Um, that right, you might recognize as uh, this eclipse on the way to Scarborough. Uh, and it was a good 10 years ago that I started writing this book. And at that time, I was doing a lot of cycling, mainly cycling on that road. Um, and the thing about being a very slow cyclist is you tend to end up cycling alone, which is fine being a bit of a loner myself. Um, but uh, so I had lots of time to think. You know, this road was this road was really connecting everything. It was connecting stories. Um, if you go down that road um, on that beach at near Misty Cliffs was during the um, earlier apartheid era in the 1970s. That was the waste dump for Ocean View. It was literally the waste was just dumped on the beach and covered with sand. When there's storms, you have rubbish surfaces every now and then. Um, but you know that that the road was connecting everything. It was connecting shipwrecks. Was connecting <laughs> contemporary struggles around baboon management. It was connecting the most extraordinary botanical history and knowledge, um, the geology, which Charles Darwin had written about when he visited here sometime in the 1800s. He was astonished by the the rocks of Cape Town and the connection between them and Rio. <laughs> um, and so on. So, you know, and then you, you cycle around to the other side and you're overlooking Simon's Town and you're seeing um, the South Africa's dead floating in the waves in the form of the Corvettes, the arms deal. Um, and there's the old well, oil refinery, which is now a shopping mall, and so on and so on. So that road was connecting everything. And yet there wasn't a way of connecting them in my scholarship. Because scholarship is so disciplinary. You talk about people, or you talk about nature, you talk about plants, or talk about animals. And where were the spaces to actually connect everything? Mm -hmm. And even when there were spaces to connect things, for example, food with energy nexus, you know, where are the people in that? Where's the social science in a food with energy nexus? Or biogeochemistry, you know, these other, these, all these fields that were emerging to connect. Where were the social sciences in them? Um, sustainability studies focusing on nature and economy, but um, stories of people's trauma, which profoundly influence what they will do or won't do um, in, in a landscape, were not there. So trauma wasn't there. The, the global economy, global Africa's Africa's so-called colonial debt wasn't there in, you know, in the stories of the economy that hurt were being um, sued by our colleagues in the sciences to try and put dollar values on e ecologies and think about ecosystem services. So there were so many gaps and trying to tell this story in the way that the road unfolded it became the beginning of this book. Among other things at the time, um, you might remember this um, bumper sticker, which thankfully seems to have disappeared from cars. Um, for a while, I was, every time I saw it, I was chasing the car to try and get a photograph. And eventually I found this one parked at the local BP station. And that saved the rhino hunter poacher. It was such an astonishing statement. You know, it's a genocidal statement in the context where people are hungry and they're not allowed to cross into a contemporary nature stance that exists all over South Africa. Um, and I, I find that as a provocative way to start to think about this idea of nature behind. Nature only exists behind fences. You know, what does that mean? Does nature not exist in our cities? Do we have urban ecologies? Am I not nature? So I began to start to think about um, the ways in which the apartheid obsession with fences and borders it, uh, was shaping the kind of environmental governance and environmental studies that were being done. And the Save the Rhino Hunter Poacher was astonishing given the genocidal history in the Western Cape, where exactly the same logic had been used in the late 1800s to justify the hunting and killing 
of the sun. Um, moreover, the little icon that you can't quite see on the left there says Palala Rhino Sanctuary. Well, Palala Rhino Sanctuary it might be, but it has a number of sub businesses in its organization structure. One of those is the sanctuary. And another very big part of it, in fact, its main income is it's a hunting lodge. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and when I read, I, mean, I still get goosebumps when you think of these extraordinary contradictions. Um, this is a uh, wax seal here was um, came up on my Facebook feed as a Ezekiel Museum photo of the, of the week at one point. And what that is, it's the wax seal from the back of an envelope from the 1830s, 18 to 1820s, 1824, I think. And that is the seal of the Office of Slaves and Deeds, which is the same office that continues to register our properties. When you have a deeds, you buy a property, you have a deeds, you know, you have to, it's registered in a deeds office. That is the same office that registers land and property and registered slaves. It's astonishing. Again, goosebump moment, right? These contradictions of a heritage, that was considered to be progressive by the British who had given legal recognition for the first time to the enslaved, who up to that point had no existence in any governance framework and therefore no protections. So that was seen as a progressive step. <laughs> More goes um, This image here is um, a satellite image of, um, I don't know, I'm answering that. <laughs> I, I don't have Zoom on my screen, so um, anyway. Um, but bottom left, this image here is an image of algal bloom in False Bay. Um, False Bay is the most astonishingly polluted bay. It's far more polluted than the, um, the Atlantic coast. And one of the reasons for that is that the Cape Flats Wastewater Treatment Works was built by the apartheid state literally about 400 meters from the coastal edge, from the sea edge, near Strathante. And the, those huge settlement plans that you see from here, that looks like a great big pizza. Those huge settlement plans were never lined by the apartheid state. So you have 40% of Cape Town's waste from every factory floor, from every toilet, every kitchen, uh, from every pharmacy going to our bodies. Going onto that sand, which also happens to abut the major recharge zone of the Cape Town's aquifer. But it, it was it, it was black land, right? Cape Flats. So the apartheid state didn't bother to line that. That water then goes straight down into the aquifer. And as it happens, the aquifer charges, recharges with water, or it, it sends a whole lot of water into False Bay. So that's highly polluted water that's going into False Bay through the aquifer. And at the same time, there's um, a, a, a effectively what well, is a green outfall, but it's not acknowledged as such, from the Cape Flats Way for water treatment works into the Ziku River, which comes down between the waste dump and the waste water treatment works and goes onto the beach. Nobody knows that. So you walk happily along that beach and you're walking through what is 400 meters away, um, the outflow from the Cape Flats Wastewater Treatment Works, which scored 0% a few years ago in the, green, in the, in the study of its microbial um, uh, compliance with regulations. You know, and Nikiwe, hello, <laughs> and I did some research on, um, based on, well, Nikiwe did the, did the E. coli counts of the Kales River, which is the opposite end of the, the Cape Flats <clears throat> near, near Makassar, is the side of Kailicha, um, and found at one point uh, intracocci levels of like 1.25 million. We, we tried to raise this with the city council. The city council said, refused to actually meet with us and discuss it. Mm. So we went to the Daily Maverick, we wrote a, a, a piece in the Daily Maverick, and its response was to accuse us of alarmism. They called us um, Academics who set off bomb bombshells without accountability. <laughs> Science, the city of Cape Town. Um, so there's this astonishing amount of waste going into, into the into false bay, but it's met with denials and obfuscations. So the version of nature, the version of 
what our environment is made up of was so problematic in so many ways. And then there were small, small things like um, the, the resistance is fertile poster, which comes from uh, the Philippi Horticultural Area Project, uh, which is, as you may know, a struggle for farmland, um, struggle for land restitution, struggle for food sovereignty, struggle for affordable food, struggle to <laughs> access the aquifer for farming purposes. Um, and so that, that, that is this astonishing, you know, amazing beginnings or a part of the beginnings of a movement of black environmentalism alongside uh, the, the Princess Flay uh, defense project. But on the other side, at the same time, you're starting to you see posters like this Cape Times uh, uh, billboard that said, Army gets stuck into pearly poachers, which, as always, is a pun um, if you're taking a pearly one. Pearly So again, you've got this astonishing with this with, with, with this astonishing contradiction where fishers are saying, but we are in a democratic South Africa. Why is the army um, stopping us from fishing? Uh, of course, the fact that abalone is near commercial extinction um, is a huge problem, but it's not mm -hmm. only poaching that's causing those problems, it's also pollution and ocean warming. Because there's a small matter of the West Coast rock lobster in the cliff, which had had a huge adult migration down the West Coast to, to Cape Point across False Bay, now to a place called East of Cape Huntley, where they literally changed the ecology. And because they, this, uh, these lobsters, these crayfish, eat, um, eat uh, sea urchins. Uh, they weren't little nursery schools for the abalone to grow up in because the sea urchins make like little nurseries for the baby abalone, abalone to, to grow up in. So in other words, it wasn't just a problem, you know, the, the crash in the, in the, the numbers of abalone was not only because of poaching, which is definitely a huge problem, but it's not only. And here we had, once again, black South Africans being blamed for an environmental problem when it, the reality is much more complicated than that, you know. <laughs> so trying to find ways to, to tell these complicated stories of histories, of traumas, of finance, of um, global relations, of colonial debt, was, was what I began to try to, to think about in our new work in environmental humanities self. So, um, the, got the right slide here. So, so what the book tries to get at um, is, it, you know, there's, there's about eight themes that I wanted to try to pick out and, and, and work with as a way of trying to think about a different eco-politics. And I specifically say eco-politics because environmentalism um, has very poor representation in parliament. Do you know any MP for the environment? There isn't an MP for the environment because our social system puts matters of society and culture in parliament, not matters of nature. Matters of nature are advised by experts um, who are not accountable to democratic process, not accountable. There's no discussion about the version of nature that's being brought into play. So the first problem I was trying to grapple with was the absence of history and colonial and coloniality and ongoing expulsions from the environment. Polobemi, for example, how is it that that people that have survived colonial dispossession, apartheid dispossession, are now just about to be dispossessed or struggling against dispossession, brought by our real liberal communist party <laughs> minister of mineral and mining. How would we get a neoliberal communist? You know, I don't understand. Um, you know, again, these contradictions are everywhere. So how do we begin to, to work with black environmentalism and beginning to recognize that Black environmentalism in a context of overwhelmingly white environmentalism in South Africa uh, really begins with land struggles. If you want to understand where the land, where, where black environmentalism is emerging, it's emerging around land struggles. The Philippi Horticultural Area, Princess Flay, uh, Fulubeni, and so on. Um, no, Jen, you're right. <laughs> She needs some water. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So, and yet those black environmental struggles were not even present in the accounting of environmentalism that's being done in faculties of science at universities around the country. I just wasn't seeing those environmentalisms emerging at all in scientific and environmental government scholarship. Um, the second, I was, I was constantly, because I was working in this terrain of, of um, environmentalism, I was struggling with a constant request from our colleagues in the sciences to please provide data for social ecological systems models. And I couldn't do it because we don't work with systems. Systems is a machine metaphor. Um, and you just, you don't see if you do a, a bibliometric study of, uh, of, of literature in the, in, the, in the social sciences journals, you're not going to see social systems you know, as, a, as an analytical framework. And we were being asked to contribute data to systems or to run systems-based models. Um, and so there was a paradigm mismatch. I wanted to think about how to do that. Thirdly, Amé Césaire's work, um, you might be well familiar with his book, Discourse of Colonialism, somewhere quite early in that, he has this wonderful phrase, colonization is thingification. And I think that aptly summarizes one of the big problems is that when environmental knowledge gets based on objects that are extractables in a landscape, um, you're missing something of the, the relationships that are what going. Uh, fourth, the theory of homo economicus is everywhere in the natural sciences, humans as economic actors. Um, but that theory of the human doesn't match, again, the social sciences, a lot of critique of homo economicus, among others from Sylvia Winter. Um, so what does social well-being mean if we, if we have a different theory of human experience? Most Is that number two? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So the second part is that this, of this urgency for an alternative eco-politics um, comes from th thinking quite critically about this idea of ecosystem services. Now, the IPBES, which happened to have its big meeting in Cape Town in 2013, is the International Panel for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Like those, that ecosystem service model reduces nature to or ecology to dollar values in an attempt to do some diplomacy with capital. But the problem with speaking the language of the, of the powerful is that you then also capitulate to their logics. So the logics of, of, of nature for profit um, <clears throat> is very problematic for sorts of reasons. Um, nature stands, nature only behind fences, are very, I've mentioned already, which tended to be governed in a kind of command and control framework. And again, a different theory of nature suggests that, that nature doesn't only exist behind fences. Uh, and in fact, if I looked at the Cape Point fence that I was cycling past, <clears throat> what the fence was keeping out was basically the ostriches and the black on one side and the law abiding on the other. But the non law abiding and the baboons and the lizards and the snakes, the birds, and everything else was crossing all the time. <laughs> so, what was the fence actually for? <laughs> um, uh, then there was the question of, of, of authority, scientific authority. You know, I'm seeing what I would begin to call a scientific authority, the, almost an abuse of scientific authority for purposes of justifying governance and particular positions. And that becomes particularly problematic in the current neoliberal era where you can buy science from big corporates like Eurofins, which is one of the companies that's provided contamination data of the oceans for the city of Cape Town. Eurofins has got 800 companies internationally. They assess, um, they do food safety, they do environmental safety. But in the USA alone, which is a small fraction of their 800 international branches, They've paid court imposed fines of something like 28, 29 million dollars for bribery and corruption. It's an astonishing figure, uh, and particularly when you bear in mind and you start to look at how many environmental cases actually get as far as court 
because most of them get stopped by non disclosure agreements, etc., etc., etc. They only get as far as court. So when court has imposed, courts have imposed that level of fines, there's, a, there's clearly something bigger going on. Uh, and our research with uh, colleagues in environmental chemistry found that, uh, uh, you know, ended up in a journal war where city officials were saying your data is wrong. This is environmental chemistry data. Um, it went to um, through the journal wars and the rebuttal and the counter rebuttal. And eventually, the team leader, environmental chemist Leslie Petrick from UWC, wrote to the lab in Luxembourg. You have to ask if there's 100 LCMS machines that can do the contaminant research in South Africa. Why I was kept on sending its contaminant studies to Luxembourg when I was asking. The when Leslie wrote to the lab manager in Luxembourg, the answer, she was asking, what was your limit of detection? Because city was saying, we didn't find what you say you found, so your data must be wrong. And it turns out that they used, surprise, surprise, the long, wrong limit of detection. So I can tell you there's no water here because this is not a liter. It's below the limit of detection if my limit is a liter. So they were working in micrograms, not nanograms. So of course, they didn't find anything. Um, so so the, the abuse of um, market-driven science um, and the use of that to assert science says, therefore, you must agree, because it's scientific. The science has said this is a very problematic relationship about political authority that is going in circles. It claims claims political authority because science is apolitical. <laughs> so you've got this, again, you've got this astonishing contradiction. <laughs> and there's, then there's the question of violent environmental governance. When science asserts its, uh, itself through policies that are impl implemented behind the guns of the state, I don't think that that environmental governance approach is politically sustainable because you're going to get pushback, justifiably so. Um, the question is, is it possible to have people's science to work people to build relationships of cooperation? Um, and then finally, in these new transdisciplinary frameworks like biogeosocial, biogeoscience, could we begin to build a biogeosocial science? So that's broadly what I was trying to get to. Um, there we go. Yes. So that's a chapter outline. Uh, I've divided the book. I decided to do six studies. I didn't want it to be book, a book just on lobsters because then anybody who wasn't working on lobsters wouldn't read it. Uh, I didn't want it just to be on fracking for the same reason. So I ended up writing six studies. Um, uh, went on the first chapter on water, second chapter on the Karoo and fracking, um, <laughs> the third on the struggle around science must fall in another video of the lightning, which was so pivotal in the in the public undermining of the forest movement, um, and I was unhappy with the ways in which that played out. And I wanted to think it differently. Then I wanted to think about um, soil, um, being sons and daughters of soil, but also to begin to work with that <laughs> in my own history as a sixth generation white South African, whose great 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 grandfather was allocated the land that is now the the um, Bathurst Golf Club outside Grahamstown. <laughs> that was my great 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 grandfather's allocation as a as a settler group leader. Um, uh, he wasn't a good farmer, and he lost it quite quickly. But that's another story. Um, but yeah, what is it? On the other side of my family, there were records of four great great uncles who together bought themselves an elephant gun and shot 100 elephants in one day at the mouth of the Fish River. So how, who am I to call myself an environmentalist? That, that for me, when I realized that, when I re learned that, again, my hair stands on end, uh, it changed the picture completely because what does it mean to call yourself an environmentalist as a white person when you have that level of history, that kind of history behind you where White wealth is built not only on land and farming, but also on the sale and destruction of wildlife. So there's a, a, a research that's in support and found that um, uh, one of the sons of the great great uncle um, 
went off to England carrying a load of ivory uh, and came back with a printing press. And that was in the 1830s, 1840s. And what I understand from my colleague Hedley Twidle in literature is that at some point in the history of Grahamstown in the wars over East Cape, um, there was a printing press that was melted down to make bullets. And I wonder if it was that printing press. And this history is always astonishing. So, so you'll note the, the titles of the different parts. The first part is past, present. How our history is present in our water governance. The history is present in the fracking of the Karoo. Where it bothered me considerably that the attempts to protect the Karoo from fracking were arguing that, and this was from some colleagues here at UCT campus, that the best, perhaps the best way to protect the career was um, to allow the fracking to go, go ahead um, to, you know, which would drive off all the farmers and then turn it all to nature reserve and do ecological restoration. <laughs> Again, that didn't make any sense to me. Um, and I, so I wanted to think about the past to present, because at the same time, on the other hand, that the public attempt to defend the career was all of these very romantic images of the career as pristine, unspoiled nature with the wind more clanking. And yet it was the windmill clanking that made it possible to chase the sand and the remaining koi out of the Karoo, um, because you could access the water from the aquifer, made it habitable, and farmlands commenced, and, the, and you couldn't only survive in the Karoo by knowing where the water holes were, which was the case up to that point. So past, present, present features, um, you know, what's unfolding, um, and then futures imperfect, um, which is a fantastic grammatical um, structure. Um, but, and there, I wanted to work on the baboons. Um, what is it to be a baboon when the phrase baboon is a, na is a national insult? Um, at one point, there was an attempt by, there, there, there was so much abuse, racial, racist abuse in the name of various um, primates that uh, at one point, um, quite rightly, uh, I think it was the ANC Youth League that proposed that calling someone a baboon would be a crime, which it should be. But what does that mean for what is it to be a baboon? How do we begin to think about protecting baboons when baboons occupy such a conflicting space in national discourse? And then finally, I um, wanted to think about ocean regime shift is moving lobsters and contamination of water and, and fisheries management because fisheries management wasn't taking account of contamination, it just wasn't in the thing. So um, this image adorns the first section of the, of the book, and uh, I've already spoken about the chapter, so I won't say much more, but this was astonishing because that was an image of a Koi settlement. You'll recognize that as work up, so we can go over <coughs> That area that must be go over the mountain into into Kennes Bay. It's true. Lion's Head. So this whole section here, but you've got the Koi settlement, and that was astonishing because I had just found a, been finished reading a paper that was written by um, archivists in France, Netherlands, and South Africa, saying that they had not found any maps anywhere which showed where the Koi had lived in Cape Town, and there was this picture. But what was so fascinating about that picture was that that was only present in the Latin and the German versions of this book that came out in 1724 written by Peter Colby. But in the Dutch and the French and the English versions, um, that, um, that that was just, just on the drawing, it wasn't on the map, sorry, it was, it was on the map in the, in the, in the, in the map and the, the picture was set in the later versions. So in other words, the colonial powers, the, 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 the language, the same book, pictures were redrawn and, and the presence of the Koi in the Cape was erased. Um, and so I think when those archivists had looked at, at um, the book by Colby, uh, they had probably looked at, at um, English, French or Dutch versions of the book. They didn't look at the Latin and German versions um, where that image was. Um, uh, present features, um, and that image of there is 
the pencil sketch of Thomas Baird's in the ivory market in my country, where um, That chair you know, you'll see in my office. <laughs> It's a Malawian ivory chair that I bought when I was 21. <laughs> um, uh, with some money I got for my 21st birthday. And it's, it's a thing I just found in a shop in Elizabeth that I loved. It's, it's carved out of ebony. But that image of, of man and woman, the generosity of the shared plant, uh, the generosity of nature, the, the fish swimming and the bird flying, speaks wonderfully of a kind of ecology and starting to think about. What are, what are African environmentalisms? Because just think about African environmentalism. Um, you can start to think about being, the phrase being sons and daughters of soil uh, speaks of that kinship with soil. So it seems to me that there are fragments of African environmentalism that we could be working with. Um, and just not to spend too much time on their features and perfect. Um, yeah, I've spoken already about those, those kinds of images. So the question was, how do we how do we work towards an eco-political social science that takes account of the politics of nature, that takes account of histories and trauma? Um, so the first thing is, I think, to really recognize that that we're in a time of negotiations over the future of the earth. How do we do that? Um, it seems to me that we're building on the work of, of Karl Marx, actually. Um, that the idea of social metabolism, metabolism of human society is a very, very good place to begin. And it's fascinating to me that if you go through an online digital copy of Das Kapital, if you look for soil, you find soil everywhere. But in the later readings of Marx, if that happened in the past hundred years or so, uh, you, you see the erasure of nature. You see the erasure of soil. Marx was centrally concerned with soil. It was the absolutely central part of his argument. Having started out as a journalist in the 1830s, recognizing and seeing peasants being driven off the land, he writes a first piece, a first major piece, which was a series of articles for the newspaper he was working for, called On the Law of the Theft of Fallen Wood, where he was asking what is happening to the peasants who are being driven off the land who are being criminalized for picking up air. To burn to, to as fuel as fuel for heating and cooking, and he realizes that there's that the landscape ecology is changing, and in the same decades um, that Darwin is traveling around the world, Karl Marx is starting to express great concern about what is the future of soil. Because don't forget they didn't have um, artificial fertilizers then, which fixed fixed nitrogen as we do now. Um, one of the things that the Europeans are doing to get, keep the fields fertile, these huge industrial fields, the new capitalists who had um, dispossessed people from land, forced them into the city to work in factories. Now you've got monocropping, but of course that soil uh, loses, loses nutrients very quickly. <laughs> One of the ways that they got bone meal in was to dig up the bones of fallen soldiers from the Napoleonic Wars of the 1790s. <laughs> so, you know, want to ask about cannibal capitalism, you know, that's when it starts. Um, it starts right there because the soil needs, I mean, can you imagine grinding up the bones of dead soldiers? How about barrack? So this whole idea of the old wagon bone merchant is very much tied up in the process. But Marx is concerned about the sustainability of capitalism because he says, what's going to happen from here? The soils are losing nutrients. In order to add fertilizer to the soil, you're going to have to buy stuff in. That means you're going to have to keep adding value to the soil. That means the price of land is going to keep going up and the price of food is going to keep going up. Um, so capitalism is not sustainable on these terms. Um, and curiously, as Charles Darwin does his travels around on the Beagle, he comes back and he's an old man and he's sitting on his own estate. Um, to find his own fields that have been left untended in all of those years of his travels were very, very nutrient rich because they were full of earthworm castings. He begins to realize that there's a relationship between earthworms and soil, nutri soil nutrient nutrition. Um, and Charles Darwin's last book is on earthworms and soil because he was concerned with the same problem. This is unsustainable. 
So building on that, um, thinking about metabolism as the basis of um, a really united science and social science, um, we can begin to think, I believe with materiality, the, the, the movement of, of nutrients, the movement of, um, of substances that are gonna produce energy, uh, we need to be looking at, at the kinds of partnerships that make earthly processes work because earth processes don't work in dollar values. <laughs> um, and it seems to me crazy that in the last 10, 15 years of natural sciences have been absolutely dedicated to creating arguments around dollar values of particular aspects of, of, of nature. Um, I think I think we can do better than that. It's, it's a useful argument, but only in a very limited sphere. Rather, can we start to think about a social science of earthly partnerships? Then to do that, this becomes where it becomes really theoretically very interesting. It requires rethinking the ontological foundations of coloniality and modernity. How do we rethink the nature of separation of nature from society and history? How do we rethink the bifurcation of self from knowledge, the idea that, that you as a scholar are producing it in, the, in the natural sciences, completely independent, abstracted knowledge. It's got nothing whatsoever to do with you. Well, these very ontological categories speak to the fact that scholarship always comes from somewhere. These ideas come from Europe in the 1600s, 1700s. Separation of space from time. That you can work with a map that just locates where things are, and you don't have to think about the processes. Um, this distinction between objects and relations. To me, I think a, a decolonial <clears throat> scholarship of ecologies and landscapes understands primarily the relations that are ongoing. There's a long um, history of extraordinary scholarship on relationality that comes from the Caribbean, from from Eduardo Poisson, from MSSA, and, and, and many others. And then also resisting the, this grammar of past, separating from present, separating from future. It's all tangled. And again, I think of, of African understanding of soil and the, the integration of political cords and ancestors and present well being in soil. Again, there's the germ of an idea um, of. That of, in, of, of integration of humanity and, and earth processes. So, but if you look at all of those, you realize a complete shift in ontologies is warranted to do this kind of work. So, um, uh, two last points. First of all, is, is habitability and sustainability, I don't think should be separate. If you look, if you go down towards the Eastern East and you see the Capricorn West Down, I'm delighted that the city of Cape Town is harvesting methane from that waste dump. That's great, because methane is one of the biggest source, I mean, because the waste dumps are one of the biggest sources of methane, which is infinitely worse uh, greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide over a 20 year period. So wonderful, they're harvesting methane. However, they're flaring it in a, in a tower that is maybe one and a half stories high six, seven hundred meters away from probably 10,000 people living in Freyfeld. Methane coming out of a waste dump is anything but pure methane. It's going to have furans, all sorts of other extremely toxic substances within it, um, which are potent toxins. So the company that, that is managing that methane harvesting process happens to be the same company that is going to do the, the drilling on the wild coast for this so the, the seismic shot testing on the wild coast, the same company. And I, I realized it was the same company when they ran full page adverts in the Sunday Times to say, We're a green company, we do methane harvesting on the Capricorn West Dump. But okay. what does sustainability mean there? So sustainability, in what sense is it sustainable if you're poisoning the air of tens of thousands of people in the short premium? You can have your ESG points on the stock market, environmental social governance. So yes, you've got a, a dollar related value um, for your environmentalism, your sustainability claim, but you haven't necessarily, um, in fact, you, you, you're adversely affecting habitability at a local level. So to me, I think there's a very important engagement that the social sciences need to be having with the sustainable development goals around questions of habitability. Sustainability cannot and should not be thought through only in terms of um, international 
of you know, international financial flows. We need to be thinking of habitability at a local level. And that's very much what, um, what African environmental thinkers like Wangari Mathai, Amal Kakabral, MSZ, um, have been, we're, we're writing about in the past um, 80 years or so. Um, and the kinds of integrations that are possible there are around in with soil and the idea of Ubuntu, as in Ubuntu, the theory of the human, um, I think has, has got a lot to, to, to offer the rethinking of the Homo economicus <coughs> model. So finally, um, our next four years, our last slide, um, we tried to implement all of that went into this book, trying to think around um, how do we do this? So we've just, um, in fact, the finance has finally landed last week. Uh, the Critical Zones Africa South and East Project, which is a collaboration through Environmental Community South of universities of Addis Ababa, Dar es Salaam, Lindongwe Agriculture, Eduardo Montanez, University of Zimbabwe and Cape Town to do six site studies um, where we just taking one area, in our case, it's the larger Cape Platts, and the Q is going to be leading that study <laughs> um, of how do we bring together climate change, um, the changes on soil and ways of those things, gender relations, there's a whole discussion to be had there. Um, policy on environmental governance, thinking about how we build a people's science and people's environmentalism, um, work on contamination, uh, Commons governance, Frank Matosa will be leading that being, and Paul, Paul is here, there is, <laughs> uh, leading a thematic research hub on building an archive of African environmentalism so we can begin to drive. But I really want to just close by saying what I took from this project, this all these studies, at, at the end of the day was, was the extraordinary richness of thought that is available in African environmentalism. And the, the sense in which the African emphasis on relationality and on kinship with soil really provides the kinds of leadership, scholarly, intellectual leadership, that um, is absent in approaches that are framed in modernist thinking with, um, with its, all its bifurcations, this integrated approach that is evident in African thinkers, the work of African thinkers, um, is to me the beginnings of an eco-political social science. Gracias. <laughs>
when one was busy, busy unmaking the apartheid model of the world, uh, its ontologies, its epistemologies, its ways of thinking and approaching the world. Um, and one of the sort of favored ways of speaking was to invoke the ironic. But the problem with the ironic, ironic as a mode of talking and speaking is you don't have to do the hard work of finding new words. You just, with your tone and your inflection, indicate that you're using these old words, but indicating that you don't actually agree. <laughs> um, um, but you're not having to do the hard work of finding, forming that new language. So as I've been thinking about this, you know, the more I read, um, the more I went through this project, the more I began to find an extraordinary liberation in reading the work of Césaire. His notebook of a return to my native land is uh, astonishing. I mean, I think it should be, it should be as crucial to any scholarly training as is reading the works of Shakespeare. You know, it's 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 an epic that he wrote after several years in in Paris. We had to grapple with Eurasia, and his question to himself and to, to fellows Le uh, Leopold Sambo and, and others was, how do we even begin to speak? when the very language of rationality, the very framework of knowledge has no space for us. You know, that was Paris in the colonial exhibition. The French were bringing people from around, the, from the colonies around the world, putting them on exhibit. Something like 8 million passes were sold to get into the colonial ex exhibition over a couple of years. We had people on display, children in zoos. I mean, it was, you know, and so since they arrived in Paris on a fellowship, having done exceptionally well in high school, and he wins this fellowship to go and study and learn in Paris, and then he arrives in Paris to find this colonial exhibition, you can only imagine him thinking, how the hell do I even begin to learn in the space where nothing that I know about myself as a human being is available? in the scholarship, in the anthropology, in the natural sciences, in this whole exhibition. My humanity is not here. The world that I know is not here. The destruction and disqualification of colonies through extraction and waste deposition, even then, even more now, wasn't part of this knowledge system. So not really the available ways of thinking connected with his knowledge of damaged bodies, damaged lands, damaged souls, psyches. So it was a space of complete erasure. And what they find, what they work towards, and what the, the this um, notebook of return to my native native land is so extraordinary in, is it mobilizes the surreal um, and the surrealist because he's able to look at this version of reality that's been sold as science, as state knowledge. Um, and his own version of reality. And it's like seeing a neoliberal minister of mining who's the leader of the Communist Party. I mean, it's like, you know, it's like, what's wrong with this picture? And they're doing a what's wrong with this picture. It, you know, it, that was the beginning of post colonialism, was that approach of what's wrong with this picture. And that's where paying attention to seeing the gap and the disjunct and the mismatch between the way we're taught to think. And what's actually there? I mean, we did a field trip last week with our Earth Politics studies <laughs> down to Cap Capricorn um, Bed Reserve. And uh, we, we were standing there. So there's Zekufle, which is a Ramsar site protected for international migrating birds. There were a few ducks, there were hardly any birds there. Drive around to the Cape Flats Wastewater Treatment Works, and there's thousands of flamingos, pelicans. <laughs> so the, the birds are actually not that interested for reasons that I, still elude me in the nature reserve. They've opted to, they've voted with their feathers and they're, they're, they're in the shit trash. <laughs> you know, these are the astonishing things. But, and then there's, there's uh, you know, and then there's the, the I could go on, but let me not give one example. Well, a little one quickly. Harrow von Lovitz, the wonderful from chemical engineering. Um, I was talking to him about this. He said, and I said we need to think about the coming wave of lithium pollution from all the 
the solar batteries that are being built because we did the cadmium pollution at the moment in the old nickel cadmium batteries. And he said, yeah, one of his students did a study a couple of years ago on the cycle between the waste dump and the surge works of cadmium, that the cadmium leaches out into the water when the rain falls into the waste dump. The leachate gets sent to the wastewater treatment works, gets processed, gets pulled out as sludge and sent back to the waste dump. <laughs> so there's a cycle of materials going from the one thing to the other. These are bad systems that we inhabit. And learning about the sea the madness, the, the leaders in being able to see the madness were the post-colonial thinkers. We were seeing the madness of coloniality and the, the, the unreal, the surreal of colonial thinking. So when you talk about erasure, um, I think to begin to work with the surreal and learning to actually see um, and bring the knowledge into dialogue, into line with what you're seeing, when it doesn't fit, that's what you work with. Thank you so much. Does um, anyone have a question? Yes. I just want to kind of a on that response. Yes. So where in, in your mind, especially in the context of this future six projects, do you see the role of the you know, other ways of knowing, such as in the magic systems? Yes. Uh, and how do you foresee empowering? Because um, the that that of being that research is it is really extractive. And uh, it, 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 that doesn't seem to empower, and this obviously you can choose a doctor, a feminist, or whatever, with that good approach. But where do, because we consider feminists as experts, but do we consider uh, rural people, rural areas who are overseeing that as experts? Where do yes. you then see the role of the, uh, the, 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 the person in the comments? Owning uh, some share in this new way of ruling and thinking and the way of ruling. Yes. Well, you know, um, the, first of all, I think I know there's multiple modernities that we have to work with. Um, and, and I think that the being open to, to theorizing with taking one's theory, for example, of the soil from local knowledge is a good place to start. Um, there are many different versions of environmentalism um, and to understand local environmental knowledge is the first step. But if we're thinking of places like Capricorn or the Cape Flats, um, people are not necessarily gonna come to you with, with um, knowledge of the soil or knowledge of, but they do have knowledge of um, water, lack of water access and being put on the drip system, for example. Which um, and then there's this extraordinary work that's being done by the African Water Commons Collective with Faiza Mayer and Connie Benson. Um, Faiza being an activist, Connie works at UWC history um, to really uh, use the experience of, of the lack of access to water in this wetland, watery landscape. The lack of access to to clean water um, is the issue that people face. So we start with what, what are the issues that people are facing um, and think with them. And in this case, one of the questions that, that is being asked is, why is water being managed on a for-profit basis? And you know, with so many of the, the companies that are managing water access are, are managing it either as private companies or on a profit-driven basis, which makes water more and more expensive. Therefore, people can afford less and less water there's less toilets that can be flushed and you end up with a cross-contamination because people go back to the bucket system um, and empty their night soil in, into the sewage, into the, the stormwater drains um, because there's no enough water to flush. If you've got a backyard shack and, you know, 20 people have got one property, you can have enough water. For. So, you know, there's, there's very real, um, what is the, what is, so there's both urban ecological issues that people are struggling with um, in other parts of our studies, for example, there's issues around um, uh, cut flower industry, 
one of the sites is near, near to an airport and there's a whole cut flower industry where probably some of the flowers that you buy always <laughs> come from there. But what that means is that people are struggling with water allocation. They don't have water allocations enough to, to grow food because all the water allocation has gone to them. So to start with what people are working with, what they're struggling with, and to use that to drive one's theory um, and to, to frame the research questions uh, so that our research questions aren't coming from the sort of professional associations of our disciplines elsewhere, but their research questions are framed at the local level. Does that answer your question? Question in the chat. Yep. Um, see if I can read it from the screen. Well, just because I think there's going to be loaded in it too. So maybe if we can um, go with the question online. Um, the person is asking on on your thoughts about water as a space looking at the disposition of land and subsequently how African people who don't have land can no longer practice their culture. What are your thoughts on water as a space and the lack of access thereof from OMFA? Yeah. Thank you. Um, um, for your question makes me think of um, a dissertation done by one of our PhD graduates, Kiko Wesselo, who wrote on the Lesotho Highlands Water Project as someone who, as a five-year-old, was evicted from the landscape um, to make way for the dam. And her, what she writes about is, in that dissertation, a really astonishing set of interventions First of all, looking at the, the flooding of the landscape, um, which turns water into a common commodity. So water is no longer part of a living landscape. Um, she has a chapter called it the, the water, the, the healer without water, the water healer without water. Because she's also talking about the concept of drought downstream, where that water is no longer able to, to meet in that landscape in, in the way that it used to. So the dam creates flood and drought. Um, and I think the, the work that she did would be something that you might find quite useful. Kifil Wesselo is the surname, S-E-L-L-O, to be on the UCT library system as a PhD dissertation. Um, and I think that speaks to that. I don't want to go on too much because I know we're going to run short on power. Uh, but yeah. Thank you for, thank you for um, that question. Um, the seminar usually ends at two, but if everyone is okay, uh, we'd like to extend for another five minutes or 10 minutes based on your questions. Um, so yes, please, your question. Mine goes really close. Okay. Thank you for the time. It's more of a comment that I want to give. Um, I did a study for an office, almost similar to that, but I was looking at the the uh, still line. Uh, uh, go, which is now a simulator, and how they <clears throat> kind of the uh, MNC and they contaminate you that not just the woodlands, the whole environment, it's like in it's the soil, it's yep. the water, it's everywhere. And so, there's a guy who also does a similar study, I think, Peter Greenwich, Greenwich, and uh, Jackie Clark. They did a study, but they were looking at it from an uh, economic sort of perspective. And my study was looking at uh, more of the health and suffering of the people. Yes. So I think it would be very interesting if someone went back and tried to look at it from a different perspective, maybe from the whole cultural connection of the soil and the whole environment to, yeah. to the people they are living in. So yeah, that's, that's my comment. Yes. There's been a very recent um, master's dissertation that's, um, that was, I was privileged to examine coming out of UWC anthropology recently that worked with um, a shack settlement on one of the waste dumps, the coal waste dumps in that area. Um, uh, it was 
just an astonishing piece of work. Um, you know, exemplary dissertation one and two. Um, her capacity to her characterization of what people are struggling with, the level of water contamination and what the, the levels of lead she tested her own glass of water, it was a thousand percent over in terms of lead contamination, just in the drinking water that she had to think. Um, you know, and, and so so and that's why I think you know black environmental struggles and land struggles. Um, to understand and to build a black environment, mm -hmm. starting where people are at, the environments of people, and whether they're contaminated by coal, or whether they're contaminated by um, by uh, sewage, um, that's where we start. Because all of that is about a, a, a metabolism that has gone wrong. How do we fix this atrophy that we live in, which includes colonial debt and a lot of the the struggle and this, the pain that people are in, in those shack settlements. Actually, if you track it back and back and back and back, it's it with colonial debt. So I was astonished recently to see um, Portugal announcing a breakthrough in climate financing, uh, where Portugal went to Cape Verde Islands, which, as you know from reading your Cabral, was to be a, a Portuguese colony. Um, and they so they agreed that Portugal would forgive Cape Verde its colonial debt if Cape Verde put its colonial debt into climate financing. To be precious. So in other words, I come and I steal your house, chuck you out, I do a couple of improvements. Um, you fight to get your house back and then I charge you for the improvements as well as to pay for the damage that I've done. But that sort of approach is being presented as the new face of climate justice. There's a, there's a need to make a strong African voice to say, no, oh, this is not right. Colonial debt is colonial debt. Don't turn that into climate financing. Sure. I think it's the last thing that the other thing that could arise would be how do you account for the interest? Especially in this area where you know there is a question of nature and the preservation of nature and the site of the yeah, yeah. you know, as you know, the urban area does and you know, to people in the community, you know, facing these forms of exclusion, but that's a reason. But we have to identify the site and sort of help us move society forward. So, so how do people talk about the urban that they need to be to be and there's this big nation question that needs to be attended. So, so you know, those two are the basic side of the side. Right. <laughs> yes, do. Yeah. No, 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 no. Um, so, in addition to that, you have a situation that in the way we have been becoming much that like, people are really struggling. And then an Australian com company comes in and says, We will come in mind, we will take out the media and whatever. And we will be fine. have better life to work with. And then it's presented as we have more unfortunate because the economy is messed up. Um, so, how do we work in thinking about the environment, thinking about the goals that the people who are living in the context here, their competing interests, and also thinking about 